All right, we're concluding our reformed epistemological perspective, which is just a fancy way to say the reformed theology's theory of knowledge and how do you apply it to apologetics. And we just have a little bit to go and then we're gonna do like kind of an overview of the book. And next week we'll, we'll move into postmodern apologetics because this is definitely dealing with a modern audience. I think we stopped on page 280. At least that's where I put my book marker. Um, I'm gonna, I think I can read with them. Like I lost my glasses somewhere, so let's see if I can read this. If apologetics is helping someone to see or experience God, then one part of apologetics will be assisting people in the removal of barriers or belief. We can help some of these scales fall. This is when negative, this is called negative apologetics, the attempt to remove intellectual obstacles of faith. Here in our day and age, the primary issues are the problem of evil, science and religion, and the hermeneutics of suspicion. And I remember we did look up, someone said, it's in the next paragraph, Blackburn. And I, I think Aiden actually looked it up too. No, I didn't. Okay, so, and fair enough, I would agree. Those are probably the three biggie of our, of our day. And we can revisit any of those, because after we do the postmodern stuff, then I want to do topics, like, can we trust the Bible? Um, what about the church? Is there a right church? Why are there so many different denominations and sects? What about the um, what my people called the sign gifts? Are they still available today? I mean, we can talk about all that stuff and more. Okay, going down. Then he talks about the apparent threat of science, and he goes off a little and says, "You, know, you, you probably should come up with a position on." Your hermeneutic, right? Is Genesis a literal historical document? Is it poetic? Is it allegorical? Is it metaphorical? Um, do you have a view? Do you have a stance on young earth creationism, theistic evolution, or are you just agnostic about it? Like, I, I really don't know. I don't think it's that important. I was that way for years until I realized how crucial the historical Adam was when you see the teachings of Paul. Because of this idea that all are born in sin, because we were all in Adam when Adam sinned. And that kind of made it a lot bigger deal to me. Now, not necessarily how old the earth is or all of that, but there at least had to be like a historic Adam. Go ahead. Just, yeah, I, I talked to a uh, about that. And I don't know, his take on it was like, it, it didn't really, it wasn't necessary. Like, what, a historic Adam? No. And, <laughs> yeah, in a sense, he was like, we can still get to that man was still born into sin. That's why I was like, I don't know. I don't know. That surprises me. I mean, that's not what he said. That's oh. not, that's, that wasn't his view. Okay. He was dealing with people that had that view. Sorry, yeah, no, that's not what he said. <laughs> Yeah, that doesn't sound like my Steve would yeah. <laughs> You said that for other people, it's just really not that big of a problem. I think because they haven't thought about the ramifications, yeah. quite frankly. Or what would be worse is they don't want to look stupid in modern academic circles. Yeah. Which, I don't know. <laughs> We can do that. I mean, we have whole classes here at the college on that particular apologetic. We have scientific policy and origins and then my philosophy of origins class. So I'm locked and loaded to talk about that as much as you want. But we do cover that in places if you want to tackle some of the other ones. Problem of evil, we talked about it some, but I'm happy to talk about that more. 
part of, I think, what really helps with that is getting people to define what evil is. With any of these, it's like, even evolution, right? What do you mean by evolution? Because if you simply mean things change and adapt, absolutely. Yes, we can see it all around us. Um, if you mean everything came from a common ancestor and produced all the life we have today, maybe not so much, or I'm not seeing that, or how could I see that? Because we, we can't go back and see that, that process. We can see it happening like speciation and stuff today and variation, but we certainly have never seen something go from one kind to another or from one species to another. Um, there are some really good apologetics for the problem of evil. I personally like St. Augustine's the best, simply denying that evil is a thing. It's more of an absence or a negation. It's like a shadow or a hole or a lacking or a not measuring up. So when God said it is good, he now made the potential. He didn't make evil, but he now made the potentiality for there to be because he has made a standard and anything that misses that is what we call evil. But it's not like God said, here's the good stuff and now I'm making the evil stuff over here. No, he made the good, but with that standard, anything that fell short of that by definition is evil. And to me, that's a lot easier way to address it than having this God up there making good things and evil things. Because making evil is not in my God's or qualities. The other two, a lot of things that we call evil, like pain, but pain really isn't evil. I mean, chronic pain, we could sure perceive as evil, like, yeah, I know my arm's injured, you can make the pain stop now. But part of having pain, right, like if you stub or jam your pinky, your whole body is going to protect that wounded member, right? You're going to go out of your way until that's healed, until the pain stops. Um, you, you may have accidentally like put your hand on an electric burner or something. Well, that pain makes you pull your hand away. If you didn't feel the pain, you might cook your fingers off instead of just getting a burn. And so a lot of what we call pain or evil is it's more just like a warning system to protect our bodies and to preserve us. And yeah, we don't like the pain, but I wouldn't call pain evil per se. The qualifier I want to mention though is when someone is suffering or in pain or has lost a loved one, I do not think that is the appropriate time to get all philosophic and <laughs> for real, right? I just punch someone in the, and I'm a pacifist, but if you just lost someone and they're just like, oh, you know, they might quote scripture at you, or they might try to give you some apologetic, and it's just like, can you see the pain right now? Sometimes it's just best to sit with people in their suffering, and don't worry about not knowing what to say. There's probably not anything to say, except, I'm sorry, I care for you, but I'm here. I worked at this group home for years, and because um, I love the free will argument. If you don't believe in free will, that's rough, <laughs> because it really all goes back to God that's making everything happen. It's not about the devil or your choices or someone else's choices. But even though I love the free will argument, I'm not going to use it to try to explain why God's letting evil happen if someone just suffered like was victimized by something. Like, like, well, do you really want God to take away our free will? <laughs> I mean, that person wouldn't have been able to violate you, but you wouldn't have free will to do good or bad things to other people either. It's just not appropriate to write that term. Uh, years ago, I worked at a group home, and it was for felons. They were like between 13 and 18, teenage felons. And they were all in there for some sort of like molestation or sexual abuse. And when I first 
applied for the job and found out what the clientele was like. It was like a house jail. We were in a residential area, but they couldn't leave. They had to ask even to get up, to go to the bathroom, to go to the room. It was super behavior modification program. But after I worked for a couple of years, I got close to a lot of the young men. I got to know them, their stories, their backgrounds. And this one young man was up late one night and he said, could I talk to you a little bit further? And I was like, sure. And he goes, man, I wish God cared about me like he cares about you. Like, what are you talking about? Of course God cares about you. And he's like, I don't think so. I was like, well, why would you say that? And he said, because for years, my dad would come home drunk. He would come up to my room and he would do horrible, horrible things to me. And when I would hear him come in, I would start praying, Jesus, please, don't let him do those things to me tonight. Don't let him hurt me tonight, please. Just this one time. He said, you know what, friend? Jesus never stopped my dad from doing those horrible things to me. What are you supposed to say to that, right? Well, if God took away free will, you know, that's no. And I told him I had no idea why God would allow that. But what I tried to impress upon him was he may not have had control over what happened to him, but where he does have a choice is, and to a degree, right? I, I, I'm not trying to make light of being victimized, especially in a humble way, but we do in a very real sense get to determine how we're going to respond to the things that happen to us. We may not be able to prevent the circumstances, but we can choose the attitude we have in the circumstances. You guys agree with that or not? Or And, and that was the strange thing about that group home experience was um, I didn't realize this, but a lot of people who have been molested or violated or assaulted, this is kind of one of those weird gender specific things. A lot of women, when that happens to them, they'll internalize it and turn all that angst and wrath and fear and all that onto themselves. And that's how people get like multiple personality disorder, thing like that disassociation. But it's almost like they become self-victimizers. But for a lot of young men, they externalize it and victimize other people. And I think the mental reasoning is, if I'm the one in control, I'm not the victim anymore. I'm the one in charge. And that's why that young man was in the group home. I mean, he didn't just wake up one day and decide to bless people, he learned it. And then instead of being like, I would, I'm gonna fight to make sure that never happens to anyone else, which was a choice, he instead chose to become what had violated him. And so that's what I was trying to get to, not to minimize what happened to him, but be like, you get to make choices every day going forward, what you're going to do with that pain and experience and suffering. Can you hear him, Caleb? It's referring to speak up a little bit. Medical acceptance is a distress tolerance tool that is not the same as preparing the suffering. And it's really kind of like an interesting concept because in like issues where like there's like a lot of conflict, maybe like you know families where there's a lot of like toxic relationships. 
and it's very like it's it's no and so like how we manage that and avoid engaging that and avoid people you know and keep their hands can be like pricey, you know, and also like another thing too is making pricey because once you have a class of like value people like those things to bring someone to each other that are aware and causing problems to others and yeah. you know, just do that on some that is aware of it but continue to make the things that are distinct. And that's we've done at Plagueis as well as too because we believe that we're doing right across the board, we know that that's what we're doing. So there's a few of us that we're doing that. And also Plagueis with a lot of like those sessions kind of trying to reflect that, but then not necessarily like giving any more flex to the other country. And in this case, it's not necessarily the same thing that we do, but just trying to like not give it away or just give it to the other side. All right, good. All right. But anyways, like I said, we can revisit any of those, but there's, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I think one of the best like, apologetics in that like, the American is like, it's such a sensitive topic and they feel like, I guess the biggest question is, you know, like why we got a lot of stuff in me and it's kind of, God can't relate to me, I can't relate to God in this. Mm -hmm. And he left me in this like, in this situation and it helped me. I think I'm, like one of the best things you could ever say is just like, you know, like he does, he gets himself. Like he understands the pain and the loneliness and no one's coming to help. And I think that's like one of the best things you can ever tell. But even though it might not help, it's still like he does understand. Like he's been exactly where not exactly where you're at, but maybe even worse. Did you see the movie The Shack? No. Or read the book? I didn't read the book because it was like all the pop evangelical rage and I can't handle that stuff. But then after it had subsided, one of my friends goes, they made a movie out of it. You got to check it out. But, uh, okay. Oh, my God, that messed me up. You should check it out. Because <laughs> it's dealing exactly what you just said. Brutal. I don't want to spoil it, but brutal things happen. And this guy is so angry at God because of what God has let happen to people he cares about. And it's like, you want me to worship you? And you can't even take care of people I love. And um, he finally has this encounter with God. And it's kind of like what you were saying. God starts to explain to him, you don't understand. I was there the whole time. I was experiencing everything. But it, it was that free will argument, too. It was just like, if I don't allow people choices and the consequences that come with them, where do you want me to stop? And it's like, oh, right. But I'm thinking, if I have kids in my garden or yard, and I know there's a poisonous snake there, I'm not going to let them go play in the garden without dealing with that poisonous snake. But for whatever God's economy, that was part of his unfolding history. And, but I ain't God. Maybe because I don't have as much control as am I, I want more control. I don't know. So. Lots of issues we can talk about. Okay. I, I love the, the little mantra question is, if there's a loving God, why is there so much evil in the world? And I was watching this, I think it was a Woody Allen movie, and he had this crazed artist guy, and he said, people are asking the wrong question. What they should be asking is, if there is no God, how is there so much good in the world? Oh. Now, I'm sure certain people could come up with reasons, but I thought, wow, that really reframes the question. Why do people do so many random acts of kindness and goodness? And where is that coming from? It's certainly not coming from self-interest. Um, maybe a lot of it, but there's true altruistic acts out there where, where people will even lay down their lives for other people. And you're like, how is that possible? Where is that coming from? But then God says that those are like filthy rags. So. Yes, if they're not done in Christ or in the Spirit. 
even that in God's economy is Then he talks about he knew some Jewish people who were able to kind of sanctify suffering and made them stronger in their faith. It's like, okay. Yeah, but it doesn't make them Christians. It makes them stronger in their whatever their belief system was. I mean, I'm glad they found some reconciliation. Book of Job, fantastic. But I think we already talked about it. The whole point of the book of Job is God is God and we're not, and he doesn't owe us an explanation for anything. And deal with it. Or don't. <laughs> but there's consequences. All right, I don't have anything else until the bottom of page 283. Anyone got anything else? We're almost done. I'm just so excited. <laughs> excited. All right. Um, last paragraph on page 283. My point is not to make people skeptics. Rather, it is my intention to demonstrate the obvious truth that rational people rationally disagree. What people start with determines what people will end up with. And I totally agree with that. And I think I showed you, like in the Middle Ages, it was the age of faith. People started with faith, then they would use their reason and their evidence but it would bring them back to their faith starting point. That's presupposition, right? But then in the age of doubt, or the age of reason, people would start with that, they would go through all the rational arguments and evidence, and they would return to that place of radical doubt. And it's just like, well then what's the point of all of it? If you're just gonna end up where you start with? That's why I, I'm a presuppositionalist, not like the ones in this book. Man, they, some people were really flaming it up <laughs> on the video, basically saying it was the most intellectually dishonest apologetic of them all. And I was just thinking, man, if they knew my level of presuppositionalism, they would just think I was a lunatic. Because I think they're still rationalists, evidentialists. I don't even need any of that. I'm just full on what. What kind of goggles are you wearing? And if you don't have Holy Spirit goggles on, you're not going to see it. He does talk about, oh, I agree with this too. There is no belief neutral system, obvious foundations of beliefs to which to appeal in arguing for the existence of God. The starting point for our beliefs is our socio-cultural upbringing, or our indoctrination, our enculturation. Our beliefs are situated in a specific historical context. Should you embark on the reason-giving project, you need to recognize this and try your best to find some common beliefs to appeal to. And I just put, yeah, be culturally relevant. Find some way you can begin the conversation. Because there's obviously some things you're going to agree on. Even if, like those different worldviews, there are some things in common. Maybe not a lot, depending on which one, but there's a few. And then his concluding paragraph, hallelujah. It is often claimed that Reformed epistemology endorses belief in God without proof or evidence. There is a sense in which that claim is true but it is surely an exaggeration. I have argued that one can reason, reasonably believe in God on the basis of an argument, but those who believe without an argument may still have a basis or grounds. The basis of some people's belief in God is the experience of God. The circumstances described above provide the occasion of a legitimate encounter with God. So belief in God can be based on reason or on evidence of religious experience. But experience of God need not be the basis of a warranted belief in God. I want to read that again. But the experience of God need not be the basis of a warranted belief in God. 
one's properly functioning cognitive faculties can produce belief in God in the appropriate circumstances with or without argument, evidence, or religious experience. And I guess if we had that particular author here, I would want to know what, what kind of belief are you talking about? Because I would agree if he just meant, yeah, someone could rationally assent that there's a God without reason or evidence or religious uh, encountering that. But I would say that belief is not going to reconcile you to God in any way, shape, or form. It's just more like an intellectual assent, like, oh yeah, there must be a God. That's not saving faith. That's not being regenerated by the Holy Spirit. That's not having a new heart of flesh replacing your heart of stone. That's just like, Oh, it sounds more reasonable to believe there's a God than not. When I took world religions at San Diego State, or it was philosophy of religion, fantastic class. It's where I learned my teaching technique. Because the professor told me, yet told us all at the beginning of class, there are about 25 of us in their graduate level philosophy of religion class. And the teacher said, now, I like to teach first person, so... When I'm doing the atheist arguments, I'm going to be all in like an atheist. When I'm are doing the religious arguments, like the five proofs of God, I'm going to be all in like a theist. And he said, this is going to sound really strange, but if you are a true believer or an atheist, this class is going to be really hard. And I was sitting there thinking, what is he, how could it be hard on, I could see it being hard on one group or the other. But it was more the agnostic and different people that were going to be okay. But anyone that held a strong belief one way or the other, he said, you're going to get worked. And it was true. And I could never tell what this guy believed the entire semester. He was so good at it. And I couldn't, at the end, he said, you, at the end of the semester, you're welcome to ask me. And so I went to his office after I was like, you got to tell me. And he said, you really couldn't tell? I said, no. And he says, yes. Because <laughs> that was his goal. Because uh, he was trying to educate us, not indoctrinate us. Like how to critique and evaluate and reason. And, and it really shocked me what he said. He said, when I look at the evidence, evidence, it is more rational to me to believe in a God than not to. Now, he wasn't a Christian. I don't believe he had a regenerated spirit. He was just, as a philosopher, believed there were better arguments for God than against. And that's cool, but that's not what I'm looking for, right? And I know it's, well, I think I know that's not what God's looking for. He doesn't just want intellectual assent. Like, okay, we think you're real. And then we go on and just live however we feel and do whatever we want. It's, it's not that knit together with that or our life is bound up in God. We're not these autonomous little free agents running around him, but we are knit together. Any comments, Caleb? And I made two little margin notes here. I said, but how can our cognitive abilities function properly if we're under the influence of sin? And what happened to the Holy Spirit? Like the rest of them, he mentioned him at the beginning, but he's, I haven't heard about him in a while now. <laughs> Maybe. But I've dragged this one out so long now, I don't. Okay. And all of these people would say, no one is coming to saving faith without the Holy Spirit. It's the gift of God. It's not reason or evidence. But then they commence to give you all the reason and evidence of the Messiah. And that's that's what I don't get. I'm glad there's people that do that. Um, just because I like it. It's like intellectually interesting to me. But I don't think it's... I do not believe that's how you are regenerated.
Okay. I don't even care what everyone else says about each other anymore. Just so finish up those five. You don't have to do that last part, but the the description, objective description, five objective strengths, five objective weaknesses, and then what you personally find. Wow, I did that a lot quicker than I wanted. So we can either call it or if you want to, if you want to talk about, does anyone want to talk about any of these people? I said we should discuss the topic. Okay, I'm going to stop this.